Hello YouTube, this is Marco. Thanks so much for joining me for a video. Another collection review, one of the very best and certainly one of the most challenging as well collection reviews I've had the privilege of doing uh, here on the channel. So let's roll the intro and jump straight into it. Alrighty, so this is a collection review for SLC Watch Collector. Before we get into the current state of his collection, I just wanted to go through a few watches that have come and gone out of his collection. So what has ultimately come and gone is a Panda Daytona. He's also had a uh, rose gold white dial Daytona. I believe he had on leather as opposed to the Oyster Flex strap. He had a two-tone Skydweller with a black dial, a Datejust 41 blue, a Datejust 41 white, a black, black, black GMT, the 6119R, an AP Royal Oak Offshore, and last but certainly not least is the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage 57. So a lot of heavy hitting watches have come and gone, obviously, from his collection. SLC not being one of your average collectors. And I just want to, of course, take a minute to thank him for all the contributions he's made to my channel and all the boys' channels. Thanks so much, of course, for your support and your continued uh, efforts on the channels. It's always entertaining to have you uh, jump on stream with us. So yeah, what is his current state of his collection? We're looking obviously from left to right, a 5960G. This is a super complicated paddock. We're talking about an automatic winding flyback chronograph with an annual calendar complication. Uh, definitely not your not a paddock that you see every day. A 5167A, this of course being the Aquanaut in steel. He's got a 5235G a 5170P, and I just want to take a moment to appreciate the 5235G, one of my favorite, if not my favorite, modern paddocks, literally like getting a paddock advanced research, but without having the word advanced research on the dial and paying the exorbitant price. Uh, definitely a watch a lot of more people should get into and research, in my personal opinion. He's got a Rolex Pepsi GMT Master 2. I think that's the best watch Rolex makes, of course. He's got a Cookie Monster, uh, of course, that is the White Gold Submariner, the left-hand driver Tudor Pelagos, the Tudor Black Bay 41, and last but certainly not least, a all-black Daytona. So diving into a situation a little bit, he says he's not a buy-and-own-it-forever type of collector, so he's not afraid to get in, in and out of pieces. He's currently on the wait list for the 5712R, which he expects to get, or at least he's hoping to get sometime this year. Uh, obviously, with rising prices of the Nautilus on the secondary market, he's obviously not 100% sure if the AD will allocate him. But I do hold that hope. I hope he will ultimately get that piece. He's starting to get interested in gem set Rolex pieces, uh, which is interesting because nowadays those are extremely hard to get from an AD. So it really just goes to show you uh, that he has a wonderful relationship uh, with his authorized dealer. He said he's open to any suggestions as long as the size is less than 41 millimeters. I tend to agree. I think from basically 37 to 40 is really the sweet spot. And he says he's mostly limited to Rolex, Paddock, IWC, Cartier, Breitling, and Omega. Alrighty, so what do I think overall in this collection? I mean, this is an incredible collection. I don't even know if you really need my advice. I think you're making a lot of the right moves, definitely without a doubt. Um, I think I'm with my collection review, I just want to bring... Not, not so much take it to the next level. I think this is already next level, but really bring a little more harmo harmony and balance to the collection that I feel isn't lacking, but could be brought to that next level, if you will. So overall, I want to segment this uh, collection review into two parts. Now, of course, first and foremost, I would tell you to add the 5712R. I think you need it in the collection, not because obviously of its secondary uh, market prices, but the Nautilus is really the ultimate sports watch from Paddock, and certainly I think in precious metal really takes it over the top. Uh, I think if you do uh, or if you can get it, it would be a no-brainer to add to the collection, and I think it certainly makes sense. But I want to segment this review into two kind of uh, two kind of collections. So the first being, of course, the Paddock collection that I want to tackle. So looking from left to right again, we have the 5960, 5167, the 5235, the 5170 and the 5712R. So just an incredible collection. Again, I really would re strongly recommend you adding the 5712 if you can. Obviously you're at the mercy of the AD, but I think I would really push to try and get that watch. Now, if you were to get the 5712R, I think it frees up two kind of watches in your collection that you can ultimately get rid of and add something 
pretty crazy to the collection. So the two watches I feel are somewhat redundant if you do add the 5712 are the 5960 and the Aquanaut in steel. Now, I will explain my thinking in this way. So the 50, uh, the 5960, in my opinion, is somewhere in between the 5235 and the 5170, right? So it's kind of stuck in the middle, if you will, in that it has an annual calendar and it has a chronograph function. And it just feels a little redundant because, again, it's a blue dial, whereas your 5170 is also a blue dial. Sure, it's a different case metal. Sure, it's a lot more complicated. Very different watch, much more sporty than the 5170 or the 5235, um, but I don't know if you need it, and it's not an insignificant amount of cash either, so I would potentially look to move that piece and get into something else. And the second one is the Aquanaut. Now, to me, it's just so enticing to potentially uh, get rid of the Aquanaut because of the secondary market prices and the type of watch it allows you to get into, right? And if you do add the 5712, I think, again, it is the ultimate sports watch you can get from from Paddock in that it's a Nautilus and precious metal. So I don't really know if you need a steel Aquanaut, right? At the end of the day, you have your tutors as your kind of tool watches, your pure tool watches, and Rolex is kind of, if you want to wear something without kind of the headache uh, of wearing something in precious metal. So having an Aquanaut just feels a little redundant, especially because of the amount, you know, of cash you can get for it on the secondary market. So those are the two models I'd you know, potentially think about liquidating. Now, I did some pretty conservative estimates as to what you could get. So we're talking, you know, roughly 50,000 for the 5960. I think you can definitely get more. But again, I like to err on the side of caution as opposed to not so much on the side of caution. Uh, and again, the 5167A, about 92,000. I think you can, again, probably get more, push the envelope uh, towards 95 and even potentially you know, 100,000, because this is a watch that sells for 110 US on the secondary, which is completely bonkers. So overall, if we're being conservative, we're talking about 142,000, which is, you know, a ton of money. And the watch I would recommend you get into is this one right here. It's the 5575G from Patek Philippe. Now, the reason for me, that trades currently around 130, 135,000. So you'd be pocketing uh, definitely some cash in the trade. Uh, if you can't, I don't think it's worth doing the trade. I definitely you should think you should get into the 5575 uh, with cash in your pocket as well. So I love this watch. I think it is outside of the enamel world times, really the best, um, the best world time paddock has ever made. And the reason I would get into it is because your collection of paddock currently consists of a manual wine chronograph, a calendar complication, well, a couple calendar complications, you would add the Nautilus, right? If we're projecting into the future, which is their ultimate sports watch. I think you're really only missing one other complication that Paddock is really known for, which is of course the world time. So to me, I think it's kind of a no brainer. I don't know if adding the enamel world time necessarily makes sense just because they're so insanely expensive. They're incredible watches, right? There's no question about that, but you can get this, I feel for a lot better value. And I think in the process, you get just an absolutely incredible watch. You get that a uh, beautiful moon face with that starry kind of night sky background. That twisted lug case is just something to die for. I have a couple of more pictures here. I mean, this is just an absolutely phenomenal watch. Now, the one, I guess, criticism of it I, I have is that it has a solid case back with the uh, words Patek Philippe Genève 175th anniversary and then 1839 to 2014 on the, the actual case back, as you see in that third picture down below. But you know, this is just a minor thing. Uh, at the end of the day, you do wear the watch on the wrist. It's not like you can see the movement while it's attached to your wrist. So I don't think it makes, it, I don't think it's a deal breaker for me personally. I still think it's just such a beautiful watch. And again, it would add that kind of harmony in that you get all the major complications Paddock is known for. And again, without paying the exorbitant price of an enamel dial world time, it certainly isn't a cheap watch. Uh, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile trade to get out of those two watches and get into a watch that I feel isn't necessarily slept on, but slept on compared to the enamel dial world times. It's just absolutely incredible. So to give you a little bit of facts about this piece, it's a world time made in 2014, obviously uh, to commemorate the 175th anniversary of Patek Philippe. It has a modified micro order movement used only in this watch. So similar to your 5235G, it's a one-off movement only used for that watch. Uh, that is able to power the moon phase complications. Actually, the first ever 
Paddock World Time to feature of Moonface, which again, I think is a really cool, interesting quirk. It's 40 millimeter case size, which perfect uh, in my opinion. And it's a moon face set against a night sky, which I think is absolutely beautiful. It has a Southern Cross hour hand, as you see over here, uh, which is actually a constellation that's used in the, um, if I'm not mistaken, in the Southern Equator uh, to ultimately help navigators navigate. And it has Geneva as the city to represent Central European time, as opposed to usually uh, it's Paris, the city that's used, uh, which is again, interesting. And it's kind of tied back to the uh, kind of, Geneva, or I guess the Geneva roots of Patek Philippe. And if you will see also from this picture, the presentation box from this is outstanding. This is, this is when you know you have a special piece on your hands, when Patek goes the extra mile uh, in their presentation of a watch. And as you'll see, Patek definitely spared no expense with this one. This is absolutely gorgeous. And I think certainly it's a watch that I would add to your collection. And this is what your paddock collection would look like. Again, from left to right, we're looking at a 5575G, 5235G, 5170P, and a 5712R. And to me, this is a perfectly balanced and extremely harmonious uh, paddock collection, right? You have a world time, you have a calendar complication, you have a man manual wine chronograph, and you have their kind of most prestigious sports watch in the Nautilus in precious metal, which is, you know, as good as it gets. I don't know if your collection from Paddock could really get any better than this. The one thing I would maybe suggest that maybe others in the comments might might throw out there and agree is maybe upgrade the 5235 to a perpetual calendar, say, for example, the 5320G, uh, which they just recently discontinued, or potentially wait for them you know, to see what they come out with this year uh, and ultimately make a decision then on what a perpetual calendar. But as you know, I'm biased towards the 5235. I think it's one of the most beautiful and underrated paddocks out there. I would tell you to personally keep it uh, and just have this as your four piece collection. I think this is so well balanced, absolutely gorgeous. And yeah, that's, that's, that's your paddock collection for you. This is ultimately where I would head the direction I would head in when it comes to paddock Philippe. So now I will move on to the second part of the collection which is kind of your steel Rolex and white gold Rolex collection. So what do I think? Again, I think you hit all the, the right notes, right? You have the GMT, the Daytona, the Submariner, which are three of the most you know desired Rolexes, three of the most iconic Rolexes as well. I think I really like the left-hand driver from Tudor. Uh, it's a great tool watch in your collection, You know something you can take with you on a destination wedding, for example. No, that's just a joke. Uh, but yeah, it's a great watch overall. I think it's a great vacation watch for sure. Uh, something you can beat around with without having to worry about, obviously, the exorbitant price tag. And the Tudor Black Bay 41, while I do like it, uh, I think it just becomes a little redundant. I don't know if you need uh, that kind of wind and wear piece, especially since, you know, you have the Daytona, you have the Sub, or you have the GMT that you can wear. And it doesn't perform, it's not a better tool watch than the Pelago. So it just becomes kind of a numbers game where it's like, how many watches do you want to have in your collection? So I don't really know if you need the Tudor Pelagos or the Tudor Black Bay 41 rather. Uh, it just be, feels a little redundant, feels a little out of place. So for me, I would just tell you to sell it just because you don't need it. It's not like you'll fetch a huge price tag for it. Um, but again, it, it just becomes a, a game of numbers. I don't, I don't, I don't think you need it. So uh, moving on to what I think you should add. Now you did mention in the beginning of your review that you wanted to get into gem set Rolex pieces, which. I think makes sense uh, because obviously you do love the 5170P as you've been talking to me about. Uh, so I would look to add a, one gem set Rolex piece. This isn't necessarily my forte. I don't know exactly what you're into, but I do know there's one model line I think that you're missing in terms of the iconic model lines uh, from Rolex, which is the Day Day. And the one I really like is the Day Day in yellow gold because that is the classic and traditional metal for the Day Day. And I really like the black dial with the baguette indices. I think this is a beautiful watch, not as gaudy and ostentatious as the kind of champagne dial, if you will. If that is your gem, absolutely, I would tell you to go for it. But I think this is a much nicer watch, in my opinion. Uh, a little more under the radar, yet still classic, still very much has that day date design language. And I think it's just absolutely gorgeous. Definitely an underrated uh, watch. And uh, among obviously the precious, you know, kind of the precious metal gem set pieces. If you want to get into the Sarus and, and what have you, kind of the gem set GMTs and Submariners, listen, that's not really my forte, so I can't really speak to that. I would definitely say 
um, you know, speak to your AD, do some re background research. I can help you with that, but it's just not, not something I, I'm particularly uh, well-versed in. So for me, if you want to get a gem set piece, I would get a classic iconic day date with a gem set dial. I think this is as good as it gets. Super classy, has kind of all the history and design language of the day date, but in a kind of modern case size and modern fit and finish. And of course, modern technology. So the second watch I'd add, ask you to add is an Omega Speedmaster, the Ed White, the 321. I think this is the ultimate Speedmaster. It also kind of would complete a sub collection within your collection. So that is uh, your chronograph collection, right? You have arguably the most prestigious chronograph on the market, that being, you know, manual wine paddock chronograph. You have the most desired chronograph on the market, which is the Daytona, let's be honest. And then I think the most kind of historic uh, chronograph would be a Speedmaster. And I think the best Speedmaster you can get or the best Speedmaster money can buy is a 3 to 1 Ed White. Again, manual winding chronograph. It uses that Le Mania 2310 caliber or the 3 to 1 movement that actually went to the moon. You get a ceramic bezel, 40 mil case size, which I think is perfect. It's ideal. That bracelet is definitely one of the better bracelets Omega has ever made. So yeah, that's those are the two watches I would tell you uh, definitely to add. And then the third watch would be to challenge you. I want you to get outside of your comfort zone. And, you know, I think you would, with these additions, would really reach the pinnacle of your Rolex collecting and, of course, of your paddock collecting. So I don't know if there's any more suggestions I can tell you to add outside of, you know, watches or brands you don't already have. And so I'd recommend, you know, starting small, maybe something like a traditional rose gold longer one. Uh, if that's not necessarily your jam, then I'd love to help you get into uh, something like an independent, something maybe from Laurent Ferrier, something from, I don't know what's, there's a ton of brands out there. I don't know what your necessarily, what your tastes are uh, when it comes to independence, what you're looking for, but I would love to help you on that journey. Uh, but at the same time, there is a big question mark uh, surrounding that last watch, because if I were to look at your collection with all of my recommendations, it does become a pretty substantial collection and it becomes a question of how deeply invested in the hobby do you want to become, right? Because just looking at these watches and, you know, assuming based on their current market value, we're talking about uh, just about a half a million dollars in watches. Now, if that's something that you're comfortable with, then absolutely, I would tell you, you know, go out on the limb and explore new brands, something that you haven't because uh, ultimately you've reached the pinnacle of Rolex collecting. You've reached the pinnacle of paddock collecting. There's not much else I can recommend unless you're kind of upgrading the, the pieces individually uh, because you hit all of the iconic and classic models from those brands that I think are, you know, the very best that you can get from the brand. So I would tell you, go to AP, go to Longa, go to the independents uh, to get out of your comfort zone. But again, it's an issue of how deeply invested in the hobby you can get into. I think you can finish off with this collection and just, you know, be happy. This would be, you know, somewhat of a five-year plan, I think, that you can realistically achieve this in uh, and just have a beautiful, wonderful collection. I wouldn't say that you're necessarily done with collecting hobby, but you can definitely, you know, relax, take a breather and maybe look to other areas. Maybe, you know, just wait for the odd piece that you think is interesting or cool and pick that up as opposed to, you know, really looking to kind of trade in and out of pieces. I think once you reach this collection, I don't know if you need anything else. I mean, you could probably stop much sooner, but you really hit again, all the highs from paddock, all the highs from, from Rolex. The only thing I would tell you is to potentially explore other brands like the likes of Longa, like the likes of Vacheron, AP and the independents. Uh, so that's my review. Guys, I'm going to end this review with some beautiful uh, photography shots that SLC actually submitted into me. Uh, I will also leave, uh, obviously, at the bottom of those those shots, the person uh, who took those, those images. And I will leave them linked down below also in the description. So be sure to follow them. They do some amazing photography work. But yeah, this has been one of the longer collection reviews. We're approaching 20 minutes. Definitely one of the more challenging ones. I think this is ultimately a gorgeous collection. I'm looking forward to seeing how your collection evolves over time and hopefully being there uh, to provide you, you know, any helpful advice that I can, because, you know, it is very, it is very much a, of a, a benefit that I get from being connected with members of the community, if you will, 
uh, and being able to be a small part in helping them in their watch collections. I think you're making all the right moves and ultimately your collection is just, you know, it's incredible. So yeah, looking forward to seeing how your collection evolves. Guys, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And again, I'll end this off with some beautiful pictures. Cheers, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.